Welcome to the introduction course of JavaScript, one of the most used languages in the market. And whether you're new to programming or aiming to expand your JavaScript skills, I'm thrilled to welcome you to one of the most paramount tools a programmer must have. This course is dedicated to teaching you the core fundamentals of the language and guiding you to a point you feel comfortable in starting to use JavaScript in your day-to-day -day basis. And before we start learning any kind of concepts, I will teach you how to write your first piece of code and how to run it in the browser. Then over the next lessons, you will learn the essentials from the ground up, starting from the basic building blocks, which are variables, passing through some code decision making using Boolean algebra, iterating over code over and over again using loops, and use more complex data types such as arrays and objects. You'll also learn the differences between data types, how you can reuse your code multiple times using functions, and the best practices programmers use when developing their code. So by the end, you will have everything you need to start building your own JavaScript projects. And I actually do recommend you to practice and try creating and experimenting with the things you'll learn in this course. Because remember, the best way to learn code is by practicing. I hope you're as excited as I am. So let's go ahead and dive deep and start learning JavaScript together. So before we get into the course, let's go ahead and understand what is JavaScript, its role in web development and why you should learn it. So back in the days when building websites, programmers would use HTML and CSS. JavaScript came later as a necessity of making these websites more interactive and able to do more complex stuff. Nowadays, these three languages are the pillars of web development and each have their specific role. So for example, HTML is the language responsible for telling the browser what stays where in the page. So for example, where you would put a button or some text and every other element you usually see in the web page and where should they be relative to each other. Then we have CSS, which is responsible for styling and changing the visual appearance of all of the elements present in HTML. Finally, we have JavaScript, which is the language responsible for handling user interaction and dynamic effects on the page, like what should happen when the user clicks on a certain button or what should happen every time a page is loaded. So things like that. Our focus in this course is to get you familiarized with the JavaScript part of web development. But if you have an interest on learning HTML and CSS, you can also go and check out my course on the introduction of these two languages. Now, while JavaScript started as being a complementary language to the front-end development of web applications, it has since evolved into other programming ecosystems. For example, if we check the front-end part, the one responsible for building the actual websites, we already have a lot of frameworks to help you the development process, such as React, Vue, Angular, Solid, to name a few. And one interesting fact about all of these frameworks is that no matter how much they change or which one is better, they all use JavaScript under the hood. So if you know JavaScript, then you should be comfortable using any of these. Not only that, but with the help of Node.js, JavaScript started to be able to be used as backend applications and servers. You also have frameworks like, for example, Nest.js, which can allow you to build very complex and scalable servers using a structured and well-defined architecture for your applications using JavaScript. So by knowing JavaScript, you already have the base to build a front-end and back-end application. And you can go even beyond and build mobile applications. You can use frameworks like React Native or Ionic that can turn your JavaScript code into native mobile code, making it possible to also build your mobile apps using JavaScript. Lastly, you also have frameworks like Electron that can turn your JavaScript code into native desktop applications. So nowadays you can tackle entire ecosystems using only JavaScript, which makes your life as a developer much easier and it makes your applications able to reach bigger audiences with more ease. So I hope this gets you excited to start learning this language and I can assure you that this is an extremely valuable language to learn as a programmer. So let's get started. Okay, so before we get into the setup environment, first I'm going to show you how you can actually run JavaScript using only your browser. 
So let's go ahead and open a new window on your favorite browser. I'm going to go with Chrome. I suggest that you also use Chrome. So we are in sync for the rest of the course and to make sure that everything runs smoothly. So in order to run JavaScript, what we need is the console and there are three ways we can do so on the browser. So the first way it's the one I suggest because it is the quickest one and that's by using a shortcut. So if you're a Mac user, the shortcut is command option J like so, or if you are on Windows, it's control alt J. So as you can see, we now have right here on the right, the console. So let's go ahead and just close this. Now, another way to open the console, let's go ahead and close it. It's by right clicking on the page and click on the inspect. So this will pop up the developer tools. And now we just need to go here and click on console. Perfect. The last way we can access the console is by going on to the top, click on the view, then developer, and then developer tools. Or if you prefer, let's go directly on to the JavaScript console. Perfect. Now let's just go ahead and zoom a little bit. Like so, and if you don't know how I did this, it's on the Mac by hitting command and then plus to increase the size and minus to decrease. So this is where we are going to start typing our JavaScript code. And one thing we can do already is to show something on the console for us. And the way we do that is by typing console, then dot log, and then open parentheses, open quotes, and just type hello world. Then close the quotes and the parentheses like so. Now click enter. And as you can see, we get the hello world string printed onto the console. And don't worry if you don't understand what this means because we are going to check all of this. But for now, just know that if you want to print something to the console, you can do so by console.log open parentheses, and then type in what you want to print to the console. Another way we can show information to the user is by using the alert. So as we did with the log, we are going to open parentheses like so. Let's go ahead and close it already. And inside the parentheses, we are going to type a string. So open and close the quotes and everything that's going to be inside this are going to be a string. So let's say that this is alert. So we want to print to the user a message saying this is alert. And the difference between this and the console log is that this will pop up the message for the user. So we get this little pop up here at the top. We get the message printed and then we can just go ahead and close it. Perfect. We can also go ahead and create variables. So for example, let's call this variable A and give it a value of, let's say 44. Now click enter and of course nothing happens because we only created that variable. And again, don't worry, I will be teaching all of this to you. So don't worry, but this is just for you to get a glimpse of what we can do and how we can do it on the console. But now if we want to see the variable on the console, then we are going to use again the console.log, open parentheses and close it. And then just type in what you want to print. So in our case, it's going to be the variable A, like so. Click enter. And as you can see, we now get on the console the value for our variable, which is 44. Now, of course, we could do all of our code here in the console, but it's not very feasible because we tend to write a lot of code. And while we can do this here, it's not very developer friendly. So what we are going to do is use what is called a code editor. And in our case, it's going to be VS code. So let's go ahead and do that. Okay. So in order to set up our development environment, the first thing we need is to download our code editor. So VS code. So in order to do that, let's go ahead and open a new browser window. Like so let's go ahead and maximize this and let's type in VS code like so. So it's going to be the first link, the code.visualstudio.com, and then simply select your operating system and click on download. So I'm going to go with the Mac one and I'm going to save it on my desktop. Perfect. So this is going to be a zip file. Let's go ahead and extract everything inside. And we already have Visual Studio code installed. As simple as that. So let's go ahead and open it. 
And the first thing you are going to see is the welcome page of VS Code. Let's go ahead and maximize it. And we can also close the welcome page like so. So this is VS Code. And the first thing we need to understand about VS Code are the left buttons over here. And of course you can go ahead and learn what each of them do, but we are just going to focus on the Explorer one. So let's go ahead and click this and it's going to open the Explorer for our project. But as of now, we don't have any project. So let's go ahead and create one by going back into our desktop and then let's simply create a new folder. Let's call it introduction JavaScript. So a project on VS Code is simply a folder. Now back on our VS Code, click on the open folder and then select the folder you've just created. Perfect, so now we are inside the introduction JavaScript project. Now, in order to start writing JavaScript, first we need a HTML template. And don't worry, you don't need to know anything about HTML. You simply need to use a predefined template in order to run JavaScript. And I'm going to do that with you from scratch, but if you prefer, you can always download the template from my website. But let's go ahead and create one from scratch. So first things first, let's go ahead and create a new file and call it whatever you prefer, but I'm going to go with the convention of naming it index and then .html for the HTML extension. Now this for me is a little bit small, the text, and in order for you guys to see better, what we can do is increase the font size by clicking command and then the plus sign, like so. If you want to decrement the font size, we can do the opposite, which is command and then the minus sign, like so. So let's go ahead and increase this. And now for the template. One way we can do this is to go back into our browser and then just open a new tag and search for HTML basic template, like so. Let's go with the second one. So the W3Schools website. And if we scroll down, we can see that we have this example over here. So let's go ahead and copy this, like so. And let's paste it on our HTML file. Now, again, don't worry, you don't need to understand what this means. You simply need to understand how to run JavaScript inside a HTML file. And for simplicity's sake, let's go ahead and delete the paragraph and the heading, like so. And now what we want to do is on the top of our body tag is create a new head tag. So go ahead and create head, like so. We can also just ident the body tag, like so. So we have everything in the correct format. And if you want to have everything consistent, so either your HTML files or your JavaScript files, what I suggest you to do is to actually download the Prettier extension for VS Code. And we can do that by going here onto the extensions button and then simply search for Prettier, like so. So go ahead and select the first one. And of course I've already installed, but you should have a install button over here. What I'm going to do is enable it like so, and you should have installed Prettier on VS Code. So you can go ahead and close this, go back onto our Explorer like so. And now let's say that we want to format our code every time we save the file. And in case you don't know, to save the file, either go up onto the file button and then click on save, or we can use the shortcut Command S. But before we save the file, Let's go ahead and configure Prettier. And we can do that by going on to the top, clicking on codes, then settings, and again, settings. Now inside our settings, let's go ahead and search for format, like so. And first of all, make sure that your default format is set up to Prettier. So if the Prettier one is not selected here, then let's go ahead and select the Prettier, like so. And of course, this is always a personal preference, but I like to format my code every time we save the file. So if this is not ticked, let's go ahead and enable it. Perfect. So now every time you save the file, you can see that Prettier automatically formats the code for us, making everything with the correct identification. So back onto our JavaScript. In order to run it, what we have to do is inside our head tag, create a new script tag, like so. And everything you type inside this script tag, it's going to be JavaScript that's going to be executed. So let's go ahead and use our previous example. 
of simply showing on the console a message, in this case, saying, hello, world, like so. Now, in order to see this, we need to open the HTML file on our browser. So back in our desktop, open our folder, and then select the HTML and open with Google Chrome. So as you can see, this is going to open a blank page because our HTML doesn't contain anything. We can see on the top the path of our HTML file. And now to actually see the JavaScript, we need to open our console. And remember to do that, command option J. And as you can see, we have the hello world we set to print on our HTML file. Now let's go ahead and simply open this a little bit more and increase the font size with command plus. Perfect. Now let's go ahead and put the VS code and our browser side by side so we can see what we are typing on the left and what we are actually executing on the right. So let's go ahead and simply close the Explorer so we have some space. Perfect. And now let's go ahead and change this to something, for example, saying everyone. Let's go ahead and save the file. And as you can see, nothing happened. And this is because while we've changed the file, the browser didn't render the new file. It only rendered the old one. So in order to do that, what we have to do is refresh the page again. And as you can see, we now have the changed value from hello world to hello everyone. Now, of course, we could type in all of our JavaScript code inside this script tag, but there is a better way. So let's open our Explorer and create a new file. Again, you can call this whatever you prefer, but I'm going to go with the convention. So index and then .js for the JavaScript extension, like so. We can already close this. And now on our HTML, let's go ahead and copy this console log, like so. Paste it inside the JavaScript file. And to make sure that this is effectively running on the file, let's just say this is inside a JS file. Go ahead and save this and save the HTML code. Now let's refresh the page. And as you can see, nothing happens. And this is because while we do in fact have now a JavaScript file, we have to link this file onto the HTML so that the HTML knows that, okay, there is this file that we need to execute. And in order to do that, we can actually go ahead and copy the script tag and paste it inside our body. So like so. You can also remove the head. We don't need that anymore. And now inside the script's opening tag, what we want to do is add a attribute called source. So SRC. And then to assign a new value, it's going to be equal and then double quotes. Inside the double quotes, we are going to reference our JavaScript file. So in our case, index.js. So now we're telling the HTML that there is this index.js file that needs to be ran on this script tag. So if we now refresh the page, we can see that now we have the log. This is inside a JS file which is not defined on the HTML, but it's rather defined on the JavaScript file. We can already close the HTML, and this is going to be our development environment for the next video lessons. So every time we want to type JavaScript, we're going to type it on this index.js file, and we are going to check all of the results in our console on the browser. If you don't want to build the HTML and the index.js files, you can always go ahead and go to my website and simply download the starter template. So on to the next lesson. So the first thing we are going to check is values and variables. But first of all, what is a value? So a value can be defined by being the smallest unit of information that we have in JavaScript. So for example, all of the strings we've been using inside our console.logs are values. So the string, this is inside a JavaScript file, is a value of type string that's inside the console.log. If we type in, for example, 23, this is another value, in this case of type number. And we'll talk in greater detail about types, but for now, let's just focus on the values. So for example, if we type in another string, like saying I am a value, then this is a value. Now, values alone are not much use for us. 
but we can actually reuse these values if we store them in a variable. And you can think of a variable as being a box with a certain name and then a value inside that box. And the way we create a variable is, first of all, with the reserved keyword let, followed by a space and then the name of the variable we want to create. So let's call this one variable A, like so. So now we have a box with the name variable A, and then we want to put inside the value 23. And in order to do that, we followed by a equal sign, which stands for the assign, followed by the value we want to store inside our variable. So in this case, 23. Let's go ahead and delete this for now. And let's log the value to our console. Again, with the console dot log and now instead of passing in the value 23 we are passing in the variable a like so so if we now refresh our page we can see that we get the log of the value inside our variable a and this is very useful whenever you want to use this value in multiple places on your code so for example if we have two more console.logs like so we can see that all of them are going to print the same value onto the console. If we had 23 in all of them and we wanted in the future to change for, for example, 22, then we had to change on the first one, the second one, and on the third one. But this way, since all of the logs are of the variable and the value inside, then we can simply change the value over here, like so. And then it will update on all of the parts of the code that are using your variable. So this is how you create a variable or in other words, how you declare a variable. Now, of course, you can create as many variables as you prefer. So for example, let's create a, another one and let's call this one something different. Like for example, temporary variable. And this is going to store the following value, which will be a string saying I am a temporary value like so so now let's go ahead and copy this paste it on the second one and let's go ahead and delete this one so now in our console we should see the value of the variable a which will be 22 and the value for the temporary variable which will be a string saying i am a temporary value let's go ahead and refresh this and indeed we get the 22 and the i am a temporary value one thing you might notice is that when I created the variable A and the temporary variable, I have the A here and the V uppercase. And this is a typical convention when declaring a new variable and it is called a camel case. So every time you want to declare a variable, we camel case the name by the number of words of that name. So for example, let's say that we want to create a variable called this is another variable that we separate the words by uppercasing always the first letter of each word except the first word. So the first one will be this followed by uppercase is again uppercase another uppercase variable and let's just assign a value for now and as you can see we've separated each word with a uppercase on the first letter of each word except the first one, which is going to be lowercase. So this is called the camel case convention. Another convention we can use is the snake case convention. And instead of separating the words with the uppercase, it's going to separate each word with a underscore. So for example, if we were to define again, the same variable, but with the snake case convention, let's go ahead and let, and then this underscore is underscore another underscore variable and then let's give it the same value okay so camel case we separate each word with the uppercase and then snake case we separate each word with a underscore of course this is only conventions and you can define the name of your variables however you prefer but i do recommend you to follow these good practices because this is going to be the typical cases that you are going to find whenever you are searching for code on the internet. Now, one thing to bear notice is that this type of convention is not typically used in JavaScript. I would argue that it is more used in languages like Python, for example. 
but in JavaScript, typically you use the camel case notation. So if you start reading JavaScript code from other people, then you will typically find this convention. And personally, this is the one I use. Now, one thing you have to understand is that some variable names are not allowed. So for example, if you start the name of the variable with a number, for example, let's say four, and then followed by variable, followed by the value, we can see that we get a error. So you are not allowed to create a variable name starting with a number, but you can actually use numbers in the variable name. So for example, instead of typing in for variable, let's type in variable four. So as you can see, this is valid. So you can have numbers in the variable name, just don't begin the variable name with a number. This is not allowed in JavaScript. And speaking of such, when creating a variable name, the only things you can type in are letters, like we've been doing until now, numbers, you can input underscores and dollar signs. So again, to create a variable name, you can use numbers, letters, underscore, or dollar signs. Lastly, variable names cannot be equal to reserved words. And in case you don't know what a reserved word is, we'll talk more about that later. But for now, simply know that there are a few words that are reserved for some JavaScript functionality. So if we try to create a variable with another reserved word, like for example, function, you can see that it doesn't work because function is a reserved word for JavaScript. And we'll talk more about functions later in the course. Now, one thing you might be wondering is, if we use here the camel case, why isn't the first word also uppercase like the others are? Well, this is because, again, only by convention, it's not mandatory, but typically when you declare a variable, the first word is always going to be lowercase. If we did the same with a uppercase on the first letter, then by convention, this is not a variable, but it's a class. And of course, we are going to talk more about that later, but just for you to know that this is valid, you can create a variable with this name, but by convention, when someone reads this and sees that the first word is an uppercase, then it knows that we are talking about a class and not a variable. So by convention, don't do this. Another thing that developers usually do is to create all uppercase, like so. And we usually use uppercase in all of our letters when we are defining a constant. So a variable that we know that is never going to change, in this case, the days of the year, because every year has 365 days. Well, that's not actually true, but you get what I'm saying. So it is a constant. It's a variable that's not going to change. And in order to know that, we typically put everything in uppercase. One last thing before moving on is be specific on the name you create for your variables. So for example, let's say we have variable x and it's going to be, for example, 19 and let variable y be equal to 2020. We could later use these values to do some kind of calculations. But at a glance, when reading the name of the variable, what does this represent? We don't know, right? We only know it is a variable. But if you are specific on what it is, it is easier for the reader of your code and for yourself, because you are going to read your own code, to know what we are talking about. So in this case, it would be, for example, the age of a person. And this one, it's going to be a year. So always be specific on naming the variables of what you are trying to achieve. Okay, perfect. But now if we try to run this code, let's go ahead and refresh our page. We can see that we get a error on line 11. So if you check here, it says index.js, which is our file. And then we get this 11. This is the line where we are getting our error. And in fact, we do have an error here, as we can see by the red. And we already know that it is because we cannot define a variable starting with a number. So one thing we can do is instead of deleting this, let's say that we don't want to delete this. We want to leave it here to know that this is not correct. What we can do is comment out the code. And to create a comment, simply add forward slash forward slash. So two forward slashes followed by what you want to be commented out. So for example, if I type in now this is a comment 
then you can see that we have no errors and this is now in green, meaning that this is not going to be interpreted by JavaScript as being something to be executed. It's simply text. So if we want to do, for example, for this variable over here, then simply do forward slash forward slash. And as you can see, it is now a comment. So JavaScript is going to ignore this line. It's not going to be interpreted and executed. And we don't have the error anymore. We know that we have this error over here because we can create variables with reserved keywords. So let's go ahead and also comment this out. Perfect. So now if we refresh it, we get the same logs as we had and we get no other error. Now, another way you could comment this out is instead of having a forward slash forward slash, you can do a forward slash followed by a star sign. And what this does, as you can see from the green, is going to put everything that's in front and below of this as a comment. And it's only going to stop when it sees the opposite. So star sign forward slash, right? So it begins over here and it's going to stop as soon as it sees the inverse. So forward slash star, everything that's inside, it's going to be a comment like so. Now let's say we want to comment all of our code. We could add a forward slash star sign at the top and one at the bottom. But a quicker way to do that is to actually select what you want to comment out. So let's select everything except the first console log and then click on command shift and then forward slash. And this will automatically comment all of the selected code. To decomment the selected code, simply type in again, command shift forward slash, like so. So now that you know how to create variables and store values inside, let's talk about data types in JavaScript. So under the hood, there are really only two types of data in JavaScript, primitives and objects. Let's start with the primitives. So the first ones are the numbers and these data types simply represent, well, numbers like decimals and integers. We then have strings, which represents text and is made of a sequence of characters inside quotes. Next, we have booleans and booleans can only be true or false and are used to make decisions in our code. We also have undefined, which is a value that it is used to represent a variable that has not been defined yet, meaning there is no value saved inside the variable. And finally, we have null. It's very similar to the undefined, except that it represents an empty value. This means that there is a value stored inside the variable, but it is null, representing nothing. Now, while there are a few more primitives, they were introduced later and are not going to be discussed in this course, but don't worry because you don't need to learn them for now in order to master the language. Now, if a value is not one of these primitive types, then it is a object, okay? And we'll talk in greater detail what a object is, but for now, simply note that these are the possible data types a value can have in JavaScript. Another important concept to understand is the ability of dynamic typing in JavaScript. And we'll talk more about this later when talking about type conversion and coercion. But for now, simply understand that in most programming languages, it is mandatory to define the type of a variable when declaring it. Like for example, in C, you have to define the data type before the name of the variable. But in JavaScript, the variable types are automatically defined depending on the type of the value stored in the variable. And not only that, but you can also create a variable with one type and then save a different data type onto the same variable, effectively changing the original type of the variable. And if you ever need to know the type of a variable, you can always use the reserved word type of followed by your defined variable. Okay, so now that you know how to declare a variable and different types that each value can have, let's see the three different ways we can declare a value. So as of now, we have been using the let keyword every time we want to declare a new variable. But let is not the only keyword that exists to declare a variable. There's also const and there is also var for variable. But what are the main differences for each? One major difference from the let and the other ones is that the let allows us to redeclare the variable. So let's go ahead and 
add a console log of our variable A, like so. If you go ahead and refresh the page, we get D13, which is correct. But now instead of declaring another variable, let's simply change the current variable A and say now it's going to be 23, for example. Let's go ahead and also console.log this variable again. And what you will notice is that on the first log, we are going to get 13, but then on the second one, we are going to get 23. And this is because when we declared the variable, we assigned the value of 13. When the code reached the console.log, then it's going to log the current value, which is 13. But then we change later in our code to save the value 23 inside our variable A. So when the code reaches the second console log, then the variable A is now going to have 23 and not 13. This is because a let keyword makes our variable mutable. And mutable simply means that it can be changed. Now for the const declaration, it's actually going to be the opposite. So if we now go ahead and console log variable B, we are going to have the 14. But now let's try and change the variable value. So variable B, and let's assign a new value of 24. Let's go ahead and console.log variable B, like so, and refresh the page. So as you can see, we now get a error. Assignment to constant variable. And again, we can see the line of our error, which is the line we are trying to redeclare a constant variable. So every time we declare a variable with the const keyword, we are making that variable immutable. So it cannot be changed once declared. Another thing to know about constants is that they have to be declared. They cannot be undefined. As you can see, we didn't assign any value and it's going to give us the error saying const declarations must be initialized. So every time we declare a const, we always have to declare with a value like so. In the long term, a good practice to have is to always define our variables with the const keyword. And in fact, that's what we are going to start doing in this course and only use the let keyword every time we know that we have to change that variable. But by default, always make it constant so we know for sure that it stays constant throughout our code and only declare with the let keyword if we know that variable has to be changed. Finally, we have the var keyword and the var keyword is exactly the same as the let with only one exception. And the exception lies on the scope of the code. And this is something that we will learn later. But for now, simply know that this is a old type of declaration. So the let and const are a more recent way of declaring variables. And in old JavaScript, every time we wanted to declare a variable, we used the var keyword. But for now, the only thing you need to know is that this exists and you should avoid it. So for now, don't use var. And later, when we talk about the scope, then we can effectively see the differences between the var and the let keyword. Now let's see what we can do with these variables and values. And the first thing we are going to see are the basic operators. And there are different kinds of operators. And the first ones we are going to talk about are the arithmetic operators. And this is the typical kind of operators that do some kind of calculations on the numbers as you've seen on your calculators. So let's go ahead and create a variable. And let's say that it's the amount of money we currently have. Let's say we have 8,000. Let's go ahead and console.log this, like so. So now we know how much money we have. Perfect. And let's talk about the first arithmetic operator, which is the minus. So let's go ahead and add a minus. And then let's say, for example, 200. So no surprises here. If we go ahead and refresh this, we can see that it subtracts the values and it stores that value inside our variable. So the minus subtracts numbers. Next, we have the star sign. So let's go ahead and create a new variable and let's call it amount money two. And it's going to be the value we have in the amount of money, then star sign, and then two. And the star sign, it's going to multiply the numbers. 
So in this case, we know that the amount of money will contain the value of 800. And when we do amount money times two, then it's going to be 800 times two. And then that value is going to be saved on the amount money to variable. So let's go ahead and console it just so we can see it, refresh. And there you go. So the star sign multiplies numbers. Next, we have the fourth left. And this one, it's going to divide numbers. So if we go ahead and simply copy this, paste it over here, let's change this to amount money three, also here. And we're going to fetch from the amount money two. So it's going to be the 1,600. And now let's go ahead and divide this by two again. So no surprises here. We are going to have the same value as we did on the first variable. Let's go ahead and refresh this. And there you go, 800. So the forward slash divides numbers. Then we have the exponentiation operator. And this is represented by two star signs. And it's going to multiply the value by itself by the number of times defined by us. So as an example, let's go ahead and create a result variable. And let's sign a 10 followed by star sign, star sign, and then two console.log, the results, and we have 100. And why is this? Well, because we are multiplying 10 by 10, two times. If we want to multiply 10 by 10 by 10, three times, then simply change the two for a three, and 10 times 10 times 10, it's going to be 1,000. So if we refresh this, we can see that we now have 1,000. Perfect. And lastly, we have the addition, which is the plus sign. So it adds numbers. So let's go ahead and pick this example up, change this to four, four, and this to three, and let's add the result, right? So we know that our amount of money three, it's going to be 800. We know that our result, it's going to be a thousand. So 800 plus 1000, it's going to be 1800. Perfect. Now I left the plus sign to the last and this was done on purpose so you could understand that the plus sign not only works with numbers but also works with strings. So for example, if we have a string one variable, which is going to be hello, then we have a string two followed by world. We can now have another variable called final string that is going to be string one plus string two, like so. Let's go ahead and console.log our final string, refresh the page. And as you can see, we now have one string that's going to be the concatenation of the first string and the second string. And of course, we don't need to add only two variables. We can add as many as we want. And in this case, let's go ahead and add another string with a space so we can separate the two words. So what we can do is right over here, create a new string, and it's going to have simply a space followed by another plus sign. So we are going to concatenate the first string followed by the second string, which is only a space, followed by the third string. So if we refresh this, we get the final string, which is the first one, followed by the empty space and followed by string two. Perfect. Now let's talk about the assignment operators. These are a special kind of operators that usually do a modification on the assignment part of the code. So for example, let's say that we want to have a final balance and let's say it's going to be 1000, like so. And actually we want to change this value. So instead of being a constant, it's going to be a let. Let's console.log the final balance, like so. And let's say we want to add 500 to this final balance and save it on the same variable. So one way we could do that is by typing in final balance and let's assign a new value. So we would do, for example, something like this, right? But we know that in the future, this value can change and now it's 1000, but maybe sometime later, it's going to be another value. So what we can do is actually get the value from this declaration. So we know that once the code reaches this part, then we are going to have 1000 over here. We're going to 
add to 500 and then store the final value, which is going to be 1,500 onto the same variable again. So at the end, we are going to have 1,500. Now, this is still not a assignment operator. This is simply a assignment with a plus operator and addition. But what I want to show you now is that we can actually do the same thing as we did, but with another operator. So let's go ahead and comment this and let's use that operator. So instead of assigning the same value and then adding 500, let's simply type in plus equal 500. So this is exactly the same thing. This is going to add the current value and reassign the addition onto the same variable. So if we go ahead and refresh this, we can see that we still have the same value. Now, of course, the same can be done with the minus sign, like so. It can be done with the multiply, as you can see, and with the division. So in this case, it's going to be 1000 divided by 500 and save it on the same variable. Perfect. Next, we have the increment operator. And this is for the cases that we want to increment something. So for example, let's say we have a variable called count and it's going to be zero. Again, let's console.log so we can see what's inside the variable. So it's zero, perfect. And we want to increment this by one. So one way would be the old way. So count, it's going to be count plus one, right? So the value currently inside plus one and then save it on the variable. Perfect, so it's going to be one. Or we could use what we've learned now, the assignment operator, like so. So this is also going to add one, perfect. Or a much simpler one is the increment operator, which is simply plus plus, like so. So this is exactly the same thing as this example and this example but with a much shorter syntax. Now, of course, the same can be done by decrementing, by putting in the minus minus operator. So as you can see, we incremented the count by one and then decremented by one again. Finally, we have the comparison operators. And while the arithmetic operators is always going to return a value or a string, depending on the type, and we'll talk more later about type conversion and coercion, but for now, simply know that JavaScript under the hood automatically converts all the types depending on the operator and the actual value types. The comparison operators are always going to return a Boolean value because we are always going to compare something and it's going to return either true or false. So for example, the first operator, which is the greater than, and to check this, let's simply go ahead and console log it. And it's going to be the following symbol. So this is the greater than operator. And we always have a value on the left and on the right of the operator, much as the other operator. So let's say 10 and then 11. So is 10 greater than 11? Well, no, of course. So if we go ahead and refresh this, we can see that we get false. But if we change this to, for example, 9, then yes, 10 is greater than 9. So let's go ahead and refresh it. And you can see that it gets true. The next one is the lesser than. And of course, it's going to be the inverse, like so. And we know that 10 is not less than 9. So we are going to get false. We then have the greater or equal. And this is going to be the same as the greater operator with the only difference of being followed by a equal sign. So this represents greater or equal than. So we can see now the difference between the first greater than and the greater than or equal if we change both of the values to the same one, like so. So this is going to be false because 10 is not greater than 10 but this is going to be true because 10 is greater or equal to 10. So let's go ahead and do it. And there you go. So we get false for the first one and true for the third one. And of course, the last operator is the lesser or equal. So it's represented again with the lesser sign followed by a equal sign. 
And there you go. So now you know the basic operators you can affect on values, such as numbers, strings, and booleans. So let's talk about operator precedence. And in order for you to see what I mean, we have the following example. So we have a variable called precedence variable, and it's going to have the following value. So 10 plus five times two. And before I run this, what do you think it's going to be the final value? So one would argue that we are going to add the 10 with the five because the first operator is the add operator and this would give us 15. Then we would apply the second operator, which is the multiply one by two. So it would be 15 times two, making this variable 30. Well, of course that's not the case. And if you go ahead and refresh this, we can see that we get 20 and not 30. And this is because the multiplication operator has a precedence value greater than the plus operator. So it needs to be executed first and only then the plus sign is going to be executed. So it's actually going to be five multiplied by two, making the value 10. And only then we are going to add 10 with 10, making the final value 20. And one way to actually check what operators have priority over others, we can go ahead and on Google type in JavaScript operator precedence. And if we open the first one, which is the one from the developer.mozilla.org, we can go ahead and scroll a little bit down. Well, actually not a little bit. I think it's on the bottom. There you go. Let's just open this a little bit more. And you can see that we have this table here with the precedence value of each operator. So let's go ahead and search for the plus operator, the addition one. And there you go. As you can see, we have the addition operator over here. And we can see that it has a 11 precedence value. While the multiplication operator has a 12. So this means that the multiplication operator has a greater value of precedence. Therefore, it needs to be executed first and then only then followed by the addition operator. Not only that, but we can also see the direction on which each operator takes effect. So for example, both the multiplication and the addition operator are going to execute left to right. For example, on the multiplication, it's going to be the left value applied with the right value. And then of course we get the 10 and then we are going to add again from left to right. So from 10 plus and then the value 10, which is going to be the result of this operation. And why left to right? Well, let's see, for example, the assignment operator. So if we scroll down on the table, you can see that we have the assignment operator over here with a order of precedence of two. So this is going to be executed almost last. And as you can see, it's not going to be from left to right, but actually right to left. And this makes sense because in this case, the assignment, it's going to be the value 20, which is the result of all of these operations. And then it's going to be applied to the left of the operator, which is the variable. So it's going to assign this value on the right to the left variable. Now, if you wanted to actually have the order we've discussed at the beginning of this video, so instead of being 10 plus the multiplication value, which is 10. Let's say that we want to be first 10 plus five and only then, which is going to be 15, we multiply with two. What we can do is use the grouping operator, which is open parentheses and close parentheses on the expression. We want to have a higher order of precedence. And if we go back onto our table, scroll onto the top, we can see the grouping operator, which is again, the open parentheses followed by the expression inside and closing with another parentheses. And this is going to have the highest precedence of every operator. So whenever you surround an expression with the parentheses, it's going to always be with the highest priority. So in this case, first, we are going to add these two values. So it's going to be 15. And only then we are going to multiply it by two and assign the final value onto the variable. So let's go ahead and refresh this. And there you go. 
So now we have 30. Now don't worry about trying to memorize all of this because you're not going to do so. This is only so you know that there is this order of operations. And from time to time, if you feel confused of why something is happening the way it is, then maybe there is something you don't understand regarding the order. And you can always go back onto this table and check if everything is working the way you expected. But trust me when I say that the more you are going to code, the more this is going to become natural to you and you don't even need to see the table anymore. So of course you already know what a string is, but in this video let's dive deeper on the many ways we can declare and use strings. So let's go ahead and first of all create a string, the same way we did before. So let's call this string one for now and say this is a string like so, and then simply console log our string. Okay, so you already know that in order to define a string, we surround the text with the double quotes. But this is not the only way to do so. We can actually go ahead and create a new string. So let's call this string two. And let's go ahead and remove the double quotes and put a single quote in the beginning and in the end, like so. So this is going to be exactly the same thing. And as you can see, once you save Prettier already formats to the double quotes, but let's go ahead and simply leave it as a single quote. And this is going to be exactly the same string. But why do we have these two options? So this is in order for us to be able to actually use a single or double quote inside the string itself. So for example, let's say that we have a string three and I want to say I'm here. So as you can see, this is not going to work because if we surround the string with a single quote, then if we have a single quote inside the string, then it's going to assume that we want to declare a string i, right? Because i as of now is the only thing surrounded by single quotes. And then everything in between here is not technically a string, it's rather nothing. And then we have the last single quote. So this is not going to work. So this is why we have both methods, because if we want to use a single quote inside our string, then simply surround the string with double quotes like so. So now we have still the string and we can use a single quote inside. And of course, the opposite is also true. So if you want to type in, for example, you are there in which there is going to have a double quotes. In order to make this a string, we have to surround this with single quotes, like so. So now we're able to use the single quotes and the double quotes inside the string. But what if we want to use both of them? So what if we want to say, for example, I'm here, then of course this is not going to work. And one way to fix this is by using what it's called a template literal. And a template literal is a string, but with a few special properties. So first of all, it's declared with the backticks, like so. So everything inside is going to be a string. And we can actually go ahead and put the single quotes and also the double quotes. So let's just go ahead and console log this. So you can see that this is in fact a string, like so. Perfect. But not only we can use the single and double quotes, but we can actually do a lot more. And in order to see this, let's go ahead and console log our string three. Okay, so we have the string three over here and we have the template literal right over here. Now let's say we want to log onto the console, a string with a new line right before the here. So for example, something like this. Well, as you can see, this is not possible because JavaScript is going to try and fetch the next double quote on the same line. And because this is now on a new line, then this is not a string. One way you could do this with a normal string is by doing an escape character. And in this case, it's the new line character. And it's going to be backslash and then N for new line. So as you can see, now we have the I'm followed by the space and then backslash and for a new line and then the rest of the string that's going to be here, like so. 
Of course, you could do this as many times as you want. So for example, if we add over here, then we have a new new line. Now for a template literal, instead of adding the escape character for the new line, we can actually go ahead and simply give it a new line. So as you can see, not only JavaScript still interprets this as a string, but if we go ahead and log it, we can see that we have the new line printed as well on the console. So a template literal preserves the new lines while a normal string doesn't. Let's just go back and put how it was like so. Now, another cool thing you can do with uh, template literals is, for example, let's say that we have a new variable and it's going to be the H like so. We then have a name variable, which is going to be a string. And for now, let's just say John and then a surname though. So we have three variables, one for the age, one for the name and another for the surname. And now we have the text that's going to be, first of all, a string saying, hello, my name is followed by our name variable. And actually let's call this first name like so, followed by a space. And let's also change this to last name. So followed by last name again, followed by another string saying, and I'm followed by the age, followed by another string saying years old. Okay, so this is a long, long line, but basically what we are going to do is create a new string saying, hello, my name is followed by the first name, followed by a space, and then the last name, and then the string saying, and I'm the current age. We save on the age variable, years old. So if we now go ahead and console.log this, we can see that we now have, hello, my name is John Doe and I'm 25 years old. Now, first of all, not only is this really, really big, but as you can see, we had, for example, to add a new string just for a empty space. So another way to actually build this text, so let's go ahead and call this text two, is using a template literal. So backticks to do so. And let's start by saying hello, my name is and I'm years old, right? So this is the string we want to print, but now we want to insert the values on the correct space. And to do so, for example, for the first name, we want it right over here. We simply type in the dollar sign followed by the curly brackets. So as you can see, it's now yellow. And this means that we want to inject a value inside the template literal on that specific position. So let's go ahead and simply give it the first name followed by a space, dollar sign, curly brackets, last name. So we are going to inject the first name and the last name. And finally, the only thing missing is I'm, and then right over here, let's inject the H with the dollar sign curly brackets, and then H, like so. And for now, let's simply open this a little bit more. And as you can see, this is a much friendlier syntax to define our strings. So let's go ahead and console log the text to, like so, give some more space over here and refresh it. And there you go. So we have the same string, but one, it's much more developer friendly, while the other isn't. Okay, so now that we know how to create some variables and do some kind of operations with those variables, let's talk about decisions. And decisions in JavaScript is nothing more than a statement to guide the flow of our code onto a specific path, depending on some conditions. So let's go ahead and create a new variable and let's call it points. And let's say we have 45 points. And assuming these points are relative to some kind of game, let's say that if the person has more than 50 points, then it wins the game. Otherwise, it's going to lose. So to make this decision, what we can use is the if statement. So if followed by parentheses and followed by curly brackets. Now, what this means is, first of all, inside our parentheses, we are going to have our expression. And this expression is going to return a Boolean value, either true or false. And then inside the curly brackets, we are going to have some code to be executed. So in a nutshell, 
if the expression inside our parentheses is true, then everything inside the curly brackets is going to be executed. So following our example, let's say that if our point is greater or equal than 50, then let's go ahead and console.log the following string. So congratulations, you win the game. So if we now go ahead and refresh the page, we can see that nothing appears here. And this is because as of now, we have 45 points. So we are not going to be executing this console.log. If we change the points to something like 55, then we will see that this 55 is going to be greater or equal than 50. So this expression inside our parentheses is going to be true. Therefore, everything inside the curly brackets is going to be executed. So let's go ahead and refresh the page. And there you go. So now we have our string. Now let's go back on to the 45 example. And let's say that, well, if the points are not greater or equal than 50, then let's go ahead and console.log. Sorry, you lost the game. So if we refresh it, okay, we can see that we get the string. And this is true because 45 is not greater or equal than 50. So this is not going to be executed and this is going to be executed. But if we change again to 55, we can see that now we get both of the strings. So this is incorrect. And this is because first of all, the expression inside this parenthesis is true. So this is going to be executed. And also this is going to be executed. What we want to say is if it is greater or equal than 50, then go ahead and print this string. Otherwise, print this string over here. And we can do that by using the else statement. So the else statement does not have a expression to evaluate. It simply has the curly brackets. So let's go ahead and put this inside our else, like so. And now if we go ahead and refresh the page, we can see that we only get this string printed onto the console. And of course, this is because either we are in this situation, else, or otherwise we are in this situation. Now, let's say we want to add another condition, which is at the top, if point is greater or equal than 100, curly brackets, then let's go ahead and console.log, you aced the game. So if the user now has 100 or more points, then we want to tell the user that the aced the game. So let's go ahead and change this to 100 like so and refresh the page. Okay, so as you can see, we now have the same problem as we did before. And this is because the points are now going to be 100, which makes this expression true. And it will also make this expression true. So what we can do to fix this is before the second if, let's go ahead and put a L statement, like so. So now what we are saying is, if this is true, then execute this. Otherwise, if this is true, then execute this. Otherwise, if nothing is true, so none of these expressions returns true, then we are going to execute this last statement. So by refreshing the page, you can see that now we only get the first console.log. And be careful with this because I see a lot of people at the beginning struggling with this and you will probably fall into this situation on where you don't have the else here and you think you have the correct behavior you want, but in fact, you don't. So every time you do decisions on your code, bear in mind and check if you are indeed creating your statements correctly. Now, this is a concept in JavaScript that you really need to understand in order to avoid future bugs in your codes. And it's the coercion and conversion of types. So most programmers often don't use the word coercion. And when they want to reference it, they usually say conversion. So, and I too fall for this mistake a lot of times because it's a fine line between the two things. But I'm going to explain you the difference and why it is good to know the distinct definition of these two concepts. And let's do this with a example. So let's create a new variable called variable A and put it 23, like so. Let's go ahead and also console.log just so we can see what's inside the variable. 
Okay, perfect. We have 23. And now let's say that we want to add something like this. What do you think it's going to happen? So we are not actually adding two numbers. We are adding a number and a string. So what do you think it's going to print out on the console? So as you can see, it printed out a string saying 23 and 10. And this is what it's called a type coercion in JavaScript. So JavaScript under the hood is always going to infer the type of our value through the value itself and through the operations applied to those values. And the first type of coercion is the add sign. So every time there is a add between two different types, so in this case, a number and a string, JavaScript will automatically convert these numbers into strings. So numbers become strings, like so. So for example, if we made this as a string and the second one as a number, we will have the same result because every time, again, there is a add operation and there is a number and a string, then JavaScript will automatically convert all of the numbers into a string. Now for the minus, let's go ahead and create a new variable and let's use the same example. So 23 minus 10, like so, console.log and let's go ahead and print this out. Okay, now we get the subtraction. So as you can see, JavaScript now, what it did was convert this string into a number and then subtract the other number, which was 10, making the final result of 13, as we see here. And this makes sense because there is no minus operation on strings, but there is a plus operation on strings. So the plus operation on strings, don't forget it's to concatenate two strings, making it one string with both of them. So that's why JavaScript automatically converts numbers into strings. But because the minus does not have that kind of operations on strings, then what JavaScript is going to do is convert all of the strings into numbers. So strings become numbers. And this is true not only for the minus sign, but also for the division, like so, and also for the multiplication. So this is the concept of coercion, is the concept of JavaScript automatically converting values from one type to another, depending on the operations. Now, conversion is more or less the same, but it's more of a implicit conversion. So we manually tell JavaScript to convert these values into something else. So for example, let's say that we have variable C and it's going to be the string 23. Like so, go ahead and console and we get the string 23. And you can see that by the difference of color. So every time it's a number, it's going to appear this pinkish color. And every time it is a string, it's going to appear white. So we know this is a string with the value 23 as a string. But let's say that we do not want this as a string, but rather as a number. Then we can do a conversion. And to do that, simply type in number followed by a parenthesis. So again, it's going to be number. And then what we want to convert into a number, it's going to go inside our parenthesis. So in this case, 23. So if we refresh once more, you can see that we still get 23, but now it's of a purple color. So we know now that this is a number. And we can actually check the types of our variables by using the reserved keyword type of. So for example, let's go ahead and console our variable C again. But this time, before the variable C, let's go ahead and type type of. So we want to log onto the console the type of our variable C. Let's go ahead and refresh this. And as you can see, we get the type of our variable, which is going to be a number. Let's go ahead and also check the type of our variable A. So type of variable a like so and we do get a string perfect now if javascript cannot find the conversion of a string to a number then it's going to present with not a number type and we can see that by creating a variable d and it's going to be a string saying hello so how do we convert this to a number right there's no number from hello so if we try to convert this into a number 
and then just log the result, you'll see that we get a not a number type. If we log the type of the variable D, we can see that it is still a number, but it is a special number, which represents not being a number. And of course, we can do the opposite. So let's go ahead and create a variable. And it's going to be a number like so. And we want to convert this onto a string. Perfect. Go ahead and log the value and log the type of the value. So there you go. You still get the 1000, but now it's on the string type. So again, coercion is when JavaScript automatically converts types depending on the operations, while conversion itself is when we manually say that we want to convert a value from one type to another. Okay, so now let's go ahead and understand the concept of a truthy and falsy value. So we know that we have our primitive types, the Boolean types, which are going to be either true or false. And we also know that if we do some kind of a comparison operator, then we can have a expression that's going to return either true or false. But in JavaScript, not only you have true or false values, you also have truthy and falsy values. And let's start with the falsy values. And what this means is that they are not necessarily false, but will become false when we convert them into a Boolean. So let's check the first falsy value that it's going to be zero. So if we go ahead and console.log the type of our falsy one variable, like so, we can see that we get the type of number. But if we go ahead and try to convert this onto a Boolean by using our implicit conversion, don't forget, it's going to be the name of the type you want to convert. And then inside the parentheses, it's going to be the value you want to convert. So of course, now the type, it's going to be of a Boolean type and the actual value itself, it's going to be false. So this is our first falsy value. It is not per se a false value, but when we convert it onto a Boolean, then it's going to be false. The next falsy value we have is a empty string, like so. So of course, this is a string. If we would go ahead and console log the type, we would get a string back. But now let's try and convert this onto a Boolean. Go ahead and log our value. And as you can see, we also get a false. The third falsy, it's going to be our undefined primitive. So let's go ahead and log this. And one more time, we have our third falsy value. Now let's go ahead and copy this for our fourth falsy value, which is going to be null. So undefined and null when converted onto a Boolean are both going to get a false value. And finally, our last falsy value, it's going to be the not a number. So don't forget that this is technically a number type, but when converting this to Boolean, then we get again false. So these are all of the falsy values available in JavaScript. Now a truthy value, once you know all of the falsy values, is everything that is not a falsy value, right? So everything that's not either a not a number, null, undefined, empty string, or zero, then it is considered a truthy value. So if we try to convert that type onto a Boolean, we would get true. So let's go ahead and try, for example, with the value of 10. Convert this to boolean and console.log our variable. So as you can see, now we get true. One more time. Now to convert a not empty string, like for example, hello, and we get again a true value. So everything that is not a falsy value when converted to a boolean is going to be true. And this is very useful when doing some kind of comparisons like, for example, checking the name of the person. So let's go ahead and use this as a example. Let's say first name, it's going to be John, like so. And let's say that if first name is equal, and bear in mind that it's not one equal sign, it's two equal signs to do a equality operator, but 
We'll talk more about this in the next lesson. But for now, just know that this is how you check if something is equal to another variable. So let's say that if first name equals false, then let's go ahead and print saying you must have a name, right? And of course, this first name, it's going to be a string saying John. So if we go ahead and re refresh this, we can see that nothing appears. But if we leave it empty, for example, if the user forgets to input their own name, then it's going to be an empty string. And we know that a empty string is a falsy value. So this is going to be equal to false. And as you can see, we executed the you must have a name code. Okay, so now let's talk about equality operators. And you've already seen this in the previous video. And this is a special kind of operation to verify the equality between two values. So let's go ahead and fetch our example from last video. So it's a variable with a string inside. And let's say that if first name equals, and again, this is the equality operator. So it's double equal sign. Don't mix it up with only one equal sign. This is the operation for assignment, while double equal sign is the operation for equality. So if first name is equal to false, then let's go ahead and console log, you need a name. So of course, this is not going to be executed, but if we leave as a empty string, then we know from the truthy and falsy values that this is in fact a falsy value. So it's going to be equal to false. So this is the first type of equality operators, and you can call this a abstract equality. And why abstract? Well, because we know that this, of course, is not equal to false unless we convert this into a Boolean. But you don't see any type of conversion here, right? Well, but don't forget that JavaScript on the background is going to do a type coercion every time there is a operation applied onto these values. So in this case, because we have the equal operator, then JavaScript, what is going to do is convert this string value onto a Boolean. And because we know that this empty string is in fact a falsy value, then this is going to be the same as false equal to false. And of course, false equal to false, it's true. And one thing we can do with our abstract equality is do some kind of equality based on strings. For example, this string 23. So if we go ahead and console something like this is the same, we can see that we do indeed have the console log being executed. And why is this? Well, again, because this is a abstract equality, meaning that JavaScript on the background, it's going to convert to the same types. And because once converted, they are going to be both 23, then we can say that they are equal. But let's say that we don't want to have this behavior. We want to check not only if they are the same value, but they are of the same type. So for example, to say that if first name equals to false, then we don't want this to be executed because the first name, it's not actually a Boolean value. It's a string. In the same way, we don't want the string 23 to be equal to the number 23. And we can do that using the strict equality operator. And the strict equality is going to be with a triple equal sign, like so. And this not only checks if they are the same value, but if they are the same type. So if we go ahead and copy these two conditions and just paste it over here, let's go ahead and add a third equality, like so. And let's say here that if the first name is equal to false, right? Then let's say that first name is false. The same way here, we are going to say that the string 23 is equal to the number 23, like so. So let's go ahead and refresh this and we can see that nothing appears. And of course, this is because they are not of the same type and therefore they are not a valid expression. But of course, if we were to change this, for example, into a number and change this false into a empty string, let's also change the logs like so and go ahead and refresh it. 
and now we can see that we have a true expression in both of the last conditions because yes the first name is a empty string perfect and the number 23 is equal to 23 and sorry i misspelled equal here okay so again we have two types of equality operators the strict equality and the abstract equality the strict equality is true if both the values are exactly the same and false otherwise while the abstract equality, it's going to apply first a type coercion and then true if both values are the same or false otherwise. Now you must be thinking, then when should I use one or another? Well, it depends on your use cases, but my recommendation is to always default to the strict equality and only use the abstract equality when you know you really need to use it in very specific use cases. Okay, so what is Boolean logic? Well, you can think of it as a kind of logic that uses true and false values to solve some kind of a difficult problem using only Boolean operators. So let's check a specific case. Let's create a new variable and let's call it car type. And this is going to be a string inside saying sports car. Next, we are going to create another variable and this time it's going to be the car year and let's put it 2021 like so. finally let's add the car seat and let's say it's going to be four like so so before we get into the boolean logic one thing we can already do is simply do some kind of comparisons on which type of car this is so what i mean by this is for example we can create a new variable and call it is big and let's say that a car is big if the car seats are going to be greater or equal than four, like so. So because this is a equality operator, then the value that's going to be inside our variable, it's going to be a Boolean value. We can also create another one and say is old when the car year is less than 2020. So now we have five values to describe our car. Now, what can we do with this? Well, let's go ahead and try and do something with the first Boolean operator. So the first operator we are going to check is the not operator. And the not operator is represented by the exclamation mark, like so. And what it does is invert the Boolean value from false to true or true to false. So for example, let's go ahead and create a new variable and say is new. So we want to check if the car is new. How can we do that? Well, just simply negate the is old, right? And whatever value we have inside the is old, then the is new is going to be the opposite value. Next, we have the and operator represented here by the double ampersand. And of course, the AND operator will return true only if both values are true. Otherwise, if none are true or only one of them are true, then it's going to return false. So let's create a new variable and say is good. So to check if the car is good or not, then it has to be big and again, double ampersand is new. Right, so in order for our car to be good, then it has to be big. Therefore, it has to have a car seat of greater or equal than four. And it has to be new, meaning it has to be not is old, meaning it has to negate this expression. Finally, we've got the OR operator. So let's go ahead and create a new variable. Let's call it is expensive. If the car type is equal to sports car or represented here by the two slashes or if the car is new so either the car type is equal to the sports car or if it is new then this is going to return true so the or returns true if either one of these expressions is true or if both of them are it only returns false when both of the expressions are also false. So let's go ahead and console log our values just to see what we're dealing with. So they are all true. Let's go ahead and check why. So the first one is the is new. So we get a true value. 
And that just means that this is old is going to be a false value, right? Because we are going to negate the value. So if this one is true, then this one has to be false. Now let's check if it is indeed false. We can see that we are doing a comparison on the car year and saying that it's only true if the car year is less than 2020. And of course, because the car year is 2021, then the is old is going to be false. We are going to negate false. So therefore the is new is equal to true. Now let's check the is big. So we say that the car is big if the car seed is going to be greater or equal to four. And of course it is true because the car seat is equal to four. So this expression is going to validate to true, meaning that on the is big variable, we are going to have a true value. So our is good variable is only going to be true if both the is big and the is new is equal to true. And because we know that they are, then this is going to also be true. Finally, the is expensive. We are going to check the car type if it is a sports car or if it is new. So only one of them need to be true for this expression to be considered also true. And because we already know that the is new is true, then this can be defaulted to true. But again, because we also have the car type being equal to sports car, then this also gives us true. We can also negate equalities. So for example, let's create a new is family friendly. And let's say that a car is family friendly. First of all, if it is big and the car type is not equal to sports car. So as you can see, instead of having the triple or strict equality, we are actually going to negate our equality. So this is going to be true if the car type is different than sports car. So of course we are going to get a false value because while it is a big car, we know that the car type is equal to sports car. So by doing the negation, this is going to give us false and false and true is going to be false. Finally, we can create a last condition saying should buy only if it is not expensive. So the negation of is expensive and it is family friendly. So if I should buy, then let's go ahead and simply log on to the console saying I will buy this car. Otherwise, let's log on to the console saying I will not buy this car like so. So of course I will not buy this car. And again, because first of all, it is expensive. So this is going to be true we are going to negate the true. So this is already going to give us false. And we know that both of the values have to be true in order for the end to return true. So this is going to be false. And this log is the one that's going to be executed. Now, if we change the car type, let's say for something, for example, SUV, then we can see that now we have true on our is family friendly. Why? Because first of all, it is big and the car type is not equal to the sports car, but I will still not buy the car because the car is still expensive. Why it is expensive? Well, not because the car type is equal to sports car, because it isn't, but because the car is still new. But if we change the date for something like 2010, then it's no longer a new car. It's not a sports car, so it's not going to be expensive. Therefore, this is going to be true, the negation. And we know that it is a family friendly car. So now we will buy this car. So as you can see, we can do a lot of complex logic using only Boolean operators. I hope this makes sense. And let's go ahead on to the next lesson. Okay, so let's say we have this variable over here representing our favorite color. And then we have this long train of ifs and else statements to check what is our favorite color and then simply log onto the console saying my favorite color is and then it should be the value of our favorite color. So in this case, because it is green, then we know that it's not going to match the first, second, third, fourth, but it will match the fifth if statement. So if you go ahead and reload our page, 
we can see that it says my favorite color is green. But this can be a little bit hard to read and for now we are only logging something onto the console but in the future when you're programming of course you want to add more logic inside of each if statement. So another way to do this is by using the switch statement. So let's go ahead and build the same case we have over here but with the switch statement. So we begin with switch followed by parentheses and then followed by curly brackets. Now inside our parentheses, it's going to be our variable. So in this case, it's favorite color. And then inside the curly brackets, we are going to use a special reserve word for the switch statement, which is case. Now we just need to match the values we are looking for for our favorite color. So in this case, let's go ahead and type in yellow, right? So we want to do something in case our favorite color is yellow. And the instruction we want to execute is going to be after a colon sign. So in this case, let's go ahead and copy this. We want to execute the console log. My favorite color is yellow. Now let's go ahead and copy this. Let's just paste it on the bottom like so. And let's change this to blue. Do the same for the other colors. And now we have our switch statement identical to the first if and else train of statements. So again, what this is going to do is going to check the value of our favorite color variable and it's going to try and match to one of our cases. So if the value inside the variable is blue, then it's going to execute everything inside this case. And it's going to go down until it finds our case. So in our case, it's going to be the green value. So if we go ahead and simply comment this out, don't forget command shift forward slash like so. Let's go ahead and refresh it. And we can see that we have my favorite color is green. But we do have a problem here that we didn't have on the ifs and else statements. So let me go ahead and change this to pink. And I'm going to refresh the page. Okay, so as you can see, it actually printed three values. So it did for the last one the black one and the pink one. And this is because the switch case works in this way. So it's going to try and match our value. So in this case, it's going to be the pink one and it's going to execute everything that's inside the case and it's going to continue downwards. So in this case, it's also going to execute the black and it's going to execute the green one. So for example, if we add yellow, then it would print all of the colors. Now, if we don't want the switch statement to have this kind of behavior, what we need to do is after each case, add the break keyword. So this means that if we match the value to yellow, then we want to execute everything inside our case and then break from the switch statement. So in other words, stop executing from here. So let's go ahead and put this in all of our case statements. And now if we refresh, we can see that we have indeed the yellow. If we change this to, for example, red, then it's only going to print red. Perfect. Now let's say that we change this value to something like, I don't know, magenta, for example. Let's go ahead and refresh it. And we can see that nothing gets printed out because we don't have the case for magenta. What the switch statement allows us to do is to actually default a value. So in this case, if the value does not match none of these cases, then it's going to default onto the default statement. And over here, we can say, for example, console log color not known, for example. So if we go ahead and refresh it, now we get the color not known because the value is not going to be matched by any of the other cases. So it's going to go to the default. So the switch statement is a handy and more readable way to handle your use cases for your applications. Okay, so this is going to be a quick video, but I think it's important for you to know the differences between a expression and a statement. So for example, a expression is everything that produces a value. So for example, if we create a variable, and we say something like, for example, one plus two, this one plus two is a expression. Why? Well, because it's an operation that will produce a value. So in this case, 
3. So this is a expression. The same way that if we have simply a value, for example, let's say 10,000, this is also a expression because again, we are producing a value. Of course, there is no operation, but it is a value. So it is a expression. The same way if we have something, for example, like a Boolean logic, like so, this is also a expression because again, this is going to evaluate onto a value, which in this case, it's going to be false. So again, another expression. Now, a statement is something that does not produce value, like, for example, the if statement. Remember that we have the parentheses, and inside our parentheses, we are going to have a expression, right? So, for example, the variable C contains the following expression, and whatever is inside our if statement is not going to produce a value. Right, so our console log over here and the code inside the if is not going to produce a value. So the if is considered a statement. So something that does not produce a value. Another statement that we've already seen is the switch statement, which again, it's going to contain a expression inside, but everything inside the switch statement is not going to produce any value. So Again, one more time, the switch and the if are statements because they do not produce any value. However, they can contain expressions as we've seen here. And of course, we can have more expressions inside, for example, one plus two, like so. And we can also have statements inside of statements. So these statements can have expressions and other statements inside. Now, expressions cannot have any statement inside. So, for example, if we try to do the variable C instead of being true and false, let's say that we want it to be true if variable A is greater than zero, then true, else false. You can see that JavaScript is complaining because a expression is expected. And you cannot have statements inside of expressions. So this is not possible. So just bear that in mind while you're building your code that if you try to do something like this, this is not possible. While in the other hand, it is possible. So you can have inside the statement more statements or expressions, as many as you want. So we've seen in the last video that if we want to do something like this, that it is not possible because we cannot have statements like the if statement over here inside a expression. But there is a way to mimic this logic without using a statement, and that's by using the ternary operator. And the ternary operator is represented by the question mark, and it works like so. So you have a expression followed by the ternary operator, so the question mark, followed by another expression, let's call this expression one, and then column expression two. So what this means is if this expression is true, then let's go ahead and return the expression one. Otherwise, return expression two. So as you can see, it's much the same as we have over here, only that this is a statement and the ternary is a operator. So let's go ahead and first of all, create the variable A and let's give it a value of 10, right? So first of all, we need our first expression, which is going to be if the variable A is greater than zero, right? Followed by the ternary operator. And then instead of having the else, we are going to have the column. And as you can see, the error disappeared. And what this is saying is if variable A is greater than zero, then return true. So put true inside our variable C, Otherwise, put false. So in this case, of course, we are going to get the true value inside the variable C. But if we put something like minus 10, then we are going to have false inside the variable C. And of course, every time you are going to make a kind of condition, normally you do with a if and else. But sometimes the ternary operator is very useful when you want to do a simple expression calculation and assign immediately a value onto a variable. 
And while this seems a little bit strange, well, rather than using the if and else, trust me when I say that you are going to use a lot of the ternary operator. So now you know how it works. Perfect. Okay, so now we are going to begin and build more complex code. And the first thing we are going to learn is functions. So a function is simply a piece of code that we can reuse as many times as needed throughout our code. And the way we declare functions is by using the reserved keyword function, like so, followed by the function name. So I'm just going to put function name, but of course you can choose whatever name you prefer for your function, followed by parentheses and followed by curly brackets. So now we have a function called function name. And as of now, it does nothing, but let's go ahead and already declare some code inside the curly brackets. So let's go ahead and simply console.log saying, hello, I'm a function. So if we go ahead and refresh, we can see that nothing happens. And this is because despite having a console log inside our function, we are not actually using it right now. We are simply declaring that there is now this new function called function name. And every time we want to use it, then it's going to console.log the hello, I am a function. Now, in order to call our function, what we need to do is simply type in the name of our function followed by the parentheses. So again, this is the declaration of the function and this is the calling of the function. So if we execute it now, we can see that indeed we get the console.log. And what's cool about this is that we can actually call this as many times as we want. So for example, let's call in two more times our function and we get three console logs each for each of the function call. Now, what's really cool about functions is that they can actually receive arguments to be used inside themselves. So for example, let's go ahead and create a new function. So the function keyword followed by the function name and let's call this one print, open parentheses. And now inside, let's go ahead and call this value. And I'll explain in a bit what this means, but for now, let's go ahead and open our curly brackets. And inside, let's go ahead and console.log the value we get from our arguments. Okay, so one more time, this is only a function declaration. We are not actually executing it. And we are saying that this function can receive a parameter or a argument, which is a variable called value. And then what we want to do is simply console.log that exact value we get from the parameters of our print function. So what this now allows us to do is every time we call in the print function, we can actually pass in a value inside our parentheses. So for example, let's go ahead and print 1337. And this 1337, it's going to go inside our print function. So the value once executed is going to have the value of 1337 and we are going to console.log the 1337. So let's go ahead and refresh this. There you go. We have the value over here. And of course we can also print a string. For example, I am an argument. So let's go ahead and refresh. And now we get the print from the 1337 and the I am a argument. Perfect. So we now just created a new function that can actually go ahead and console.log whatever value we prefer. And not only that, but it also has a shorter syntax than console.log. Now, not only they can receive variables from the outside, but they can actually go ahead and return new values to the outside. So let's go ahead and create a new function and let's call this one add. And it's going to receive a value one and a value two. Now bear in mind that the name of these variables is entirely up to your choice. So you could put, for example, A or B here. And then inside the function, you just have to reference all of the variables by their respective name inside of the function. Now, as the name of the function suggests, we are going to add these two values. So let's go ahead and create a new variable. Let's call it result. And it's going to be value one plus value 
what we can now do is return. And again, this is a reserved word, the result. So what this does is every time now we call in the add function by passing in two values, it's going to add the two values. It's going to store on the result variable, and then it's going to return the result. So now what we can do is go ahead and console.log the add function with the value of one and two. So let's go ahead and check out the flow first. So we have the add function. We are going to pass in the value of one and the value of two. So the value one, it's going to have one and the value of two, it's going to have two. It's going to be added up on this operation, saved on the result. And then the function is going to return the result. So this function right here now has the value of three. So we are going to console.log three. And there you go. As you can see, we have the sum printed out onto the console. And of course, you can also store this value in a variable. Like for example, let's go ahead and add a new variable called add result. And it's going to be add and let's pass in 100 with 20. So if we go ahead and console.log now the add result, like so, then we are going to see 120. Perfect. Okay, so now that we know how to create functions, let's learn the differences between a function declaration and a function expression. So a function declaration is what we've already done on the previous video. So let's go ahead and declare a new function, beginning with the keyword function, followed by the name of the function. And in this case, it's going to be sub for subtract, and then A and B, open curly brackets, and let's go ahead and create a result variable by subtracting A and B. Don't forget to return the result. And we now have a function declaration. Now, before we continue, one thing we can actually do to this function is to reduce a little bit more. And we can do so by instead of saving the value of the subtraction onto the variable result and then returning the variable, we can actually go ahead and simply return the expression like so. And this will give us a much shorter and visible function. Perfect. Now, the other type is called a function expression or a anonymous function. And the difference between the function declaration is that this one is created without a name and saved inside a variable. So let's go ahead and try to replicate the add function from the previous video, but now using a function expression. So let's create a variable and call it add. And now this add is actually going to be a function. Now we start with the parentheses. So as you can see, we are not passing in the name of the function before, like we did on the declaration. And this is because the name of the function, it's going to be the name of the variable. And then curly brackets. Now we can pass in the value one and value two. And then for the add is simply going to be a return of a plus b. See the difference? So in the function declaration, you define the function and the function name, while in the function expression, you are actually creating a function and saving inside the variable add. Now, of course, because this variable is now a function, we can call this variable much like we do with a function. So let's go ahead and try to add 10 with five and let's console.log the result. And as you can see, we have 15. Perfect. Let's also console.log the sub function and we have five. Perfect. So we have the sub function here as a function declaration and the add as a function expression. Now, why have both and which one to choose? So first things first, there is a huge difference between the two. For example, if we take in the sub function, which we know is a function declaration, Let's go ahead and cut this and let's copy this here at the top. So we are trying to execute the function before its declaration, right? Well, the good thing about function declaration is that no matter where this is on the code, if we go ahead and refresh it, you can see that it still works. While on the function expression, if we try to run the function before the initialization, 
then you will see that we get an error saying cannot access add, which is our variable over here, before initialization. And of course, because we only initialized it as a variable over at line 11, then of course we cannot call it on line 8 because there is no variable yet initialized. While a function declaration, we can have it wherever we prefer on the code and it will always work, as you can see here. Now, for me personally, I prefer to use the function declaration, but it's just a matter of preference. I see a lot of developers that do in fact prefer the function expression. And one argument they give is that this forces you as a developer to always have the functions at the top of your files in order for everything to work. So you can have your code more organized. But for me personally, I already do that, but with the function declaration. So I tend to always put my functions at the top. But again, this is completely up to you. Now, remember when I said that instead of returning the variable with the result, we could simply return the expression of adding the two values. And this indeed did make our function more readable and shorter. But we can even make it shorter by using what is called a arrow function. And much like the function expression, we initialize our arrow function by saving in a variable. So let's go ahead and create the add variable again. And of course, this is going to give us an error because there is already a add variable declared. So for now, let's simply go ahead and comment this out. And to create a arrow function, we start with the parentheses for the arguments of the function, followed by a equal sign and a greater than symbol. And as you can see, this kind of mimics a arrow and that's why this is called a arrow function. Finally, the curly brackets with the code inside. So as of now, we already have a arrow function. If we want to implement the same way as we did here at the top, then first of all, we are going to need the A variable and the B variable, and then inside simply return A plus B. So let's go ahead and console.log, add two and three, making the value five, perfect. Now, why would you do this? Well, it is shorter, but one good thing about arrow functions is that they don't necessarily need a return statement. So let's go ahead and delete this. And not only that, but we can also delete the curly brackets. So we can actually leave, as you can see, as simple as this. So this is our arrow function. It accepts a variable A, a variable B, and then it's going to return A plus B. So if we go now and refresh this, as you can see, we still have our five. If we go ahead and change this to four, for example, we can see that it's still making the addition correctly. And as you can see, this is much, much shorter than what we had before and much more readable since we know exactly what it is doing on the first line of the initialization. And now you must be thinking, okay, but why go to such a trouble to make this shorter? Well, trust me when I say that in the future, you will encounter a lot of these examples and you will be doing this yourself. Trust me. Sometimes we don't need a complex function. We simply need something that does a simple logic, but we have to call it multiple times. And if we do it like an arrow function, then it becomes more visible to the developer and more friendly and easier to use. Okay, so now let's talk about another data structure, which are called arrays. And the purpose of array is to store multiple values. So if you think of a variable as being a box with a value inside, then an array can be thought of as a set of boxes or a train of boxes, all with values inside. So for example, let's say that we have three variables. So variable A with one, variable B with the value two, and then variable C with the value three. So of course, these are three separate variables, but what we can do is instead of creating these three variables, we can actually create an array with the three values. So one, two, and three. And in order to create a array, first of all, it's going to be a variable. So let's give it a name, for example, like array one. And now to initialize an array, we can start off with the square brackets. 
So once we declare our variable with a square brackets, then we are saying that this is going to be a variable containing multiple values, so an array. If we want to already initialize the array with the set of values we have over here, we can do so by passing in the values and separating each of the values with a com, like so. So if we now go ahead and console log our array, as you can see, not only we get the values, but you see that we get on this array format. So we have the square brackets and not only that, but the browser is going to interpret this as an array and it's going to have this nice syntax on which you can see each of the values on each of the boxes inside the array. Another way to create an array is by using, first of all, the new reserved word followed by array and the array has to be with a capital letter at the beginning and followed by a parenthesis. Now what we can do is the same as we did with the previous array and just pass in the values we want inside our array like so. So let's go ahead and log our second array and let's see what we have inside. It's exactly the same as the first one. Perfect. Now one thing you might notice when you open your array here on the console is that you have the values here on the right and then on the left you have this 0, 1 and 2 and just so we don't get ourselves confused let's go ahead and change the values of the second array to something like 20, 30 and then 10. Let's go ahead and refresh. We can see that the values changed but the 0, 1 and 2 remain there. And what this represents is the actual position of the value inside the array. So our value of 20, it's going to be on the first position. And in programming, arrays always start with position 0, not position 1. Then on the second position, represented here by the 1, it's going to have the 30 value. And then on the third position, again represented here by the number 2, it's going to have the value of 10. What we can now do is actually access one of these positions and get the value from the array. And the way we do that is, let's go ahead and create a new variable, call it array value, and let's get the value of the second position of the array. So we type in the name of our array, and then we open the square brackets, and finally we type in the position we want to get the value from. So if we want the second position of the array, then we type in one, because again, the first position starts with zero. So now let's go ahead and console.log and refresh. And there you go. So we logged 30 because it is correct. It's the position number one, meaning the second position inside the array. Another useful thing you can do with arrays is to actually get the length of the array. So let's go ahead and type in our array 2 and then to see how many elements we have inside the array we simply type in dot and then type in length. So as you can see we get back 3 because there are 3 elements inside our array. Now let's say we want to get the last element of our array. Well one way we could do that is to first of all let's console.log call in our array and then simply type in 2 right because it is correct. This is the last value we have inside our array. But what if we now change our array to something like this? Then we still get the 10, but it is not the last item of our array. So one way we could do this is to get the position of the last element. And we can do so by, instead of passing in a number inside the brackets, we can actually pass in the length of the array itself. So it's going to be four, right? Minus one, because we don't want the position zero, one, two, we want the position three, meaning the fourth element. So that's why we do minus one. This way, independently on the number of elements inside the array, we will always get the value of the last item. We can also reassign new values to certain positions of the array. So for example, let's say we want to change the second position to be 8000. Then let's go ahead and console.log. And there you go. We changed the value from 30 
which we could see here on the first console log of the array. And then on the last console log, we're already creating the array with the new value we assign on the position one. Now, one thing you might be thinking is, well, but isn't this a constant? So it should be immutable, right? Well, the thing is only primitives are immutable in JavaScript. And if we change a position of an array, we are not actually changing a primitive. We are changing a object. So therefore, independently, whether you put a constant or a let, you can change the values inside of the array. What you cannot do is to change the array itself. So let's say that now we want our array 2 to be something like this. Then you can see now that we get an error on the line 21. And this is because the whole array itself is immutable, but not the values inside each position of the array. Now, one thing about arrays in JavaScript is that you don't necessarily need to create an array with all of the same types of values. So for example, in this array, we can have a number here. We can then have a string on the second position, or we can have a Boolean, for example. So this is valid. Let's go ahead and confirm it. And there you go. We got our array with a number, a string, and a Boolean. And not only that, but we can also have arrays inside arrays. So for example, let's add a fourth element onto our array, which will be another array. And then inside, let's have, for example, one, two, three, like so. See, so now we have four elements in our array, a number, a string, and a boolean. And then the fourth element is going to be another array with three elements. So if we open this, you can see that the element on position three is going to be our new array of one, two, three. You can even go ahead and open this. Not only that, but you can also have expressions inside. So instead of having, for example, a boolean here, let's say we want to have a comparison of the first element of array one and check if it is greater or equal than the first element of array two, right? So let's go ahead and check this. The first element of array one is going to be one. And then the first element of array two is going to be 20. Is one greater or equal than 20? No. Then this is going to save false in this position. So let's go ahead and refresh it. And there you go. We can also have expressions inside array elements. Okay, so now that we know what a array is and how they are created, let's go ahead and see how we can manipulate them using array methods. And when I say methods, I also mean functions. So they are basically the same. And the arrays in JavaScript as some built-in methods that can help us do some kind of modifications on the arrays. And the first method we are going to see is the push. So the push method, what it does is add a new element at the end of the array, and then simply returns the new length of that modified array. So for example, let's say that we want to add the number zero at the end of our example array, then we would do example array dot push, and then inside parentheses, because again, this is a function, simply pass in the value you want to push. Let's go ahead and log the array again. And as you can see, first we had only three values and now we have the value zero at the end of our array. Perfect. Now, if you want to add an element at the beginning of the array, then you can use the unshift method. So this is going to be the same as the push, but instead of appending a new element at the end of the array, it's going to do it at the beginning. So let's go ahead and type in our array and then unshift and let's add a number 10, like so. Go ahead and console.log. And now we have the number 10 at the beginning of our array and we still have the value zero at the end. Now, if we want to remove the last element of the array, it's with the pop method. So let's go ahead and do so. It doesn't accept any value because it's only going to remove the last element. And we can actually go ahead and create a new variable Let's call it removed elements. And it's going to be equal because the pop method not only removes the last element, but also returns the element that was removed. So let's go ahead and now see our array. 
and let's also see the element that was removed. Okay, perfect. So now we don't have the zero inside. And as you can see, this is in fact the element that was removed. Now, the same thing only for the beginning is going to be with the shift method. So the same way we have the unshift to append a new element at the beginning, we now have the shift to remove the first element at the beginning of the array. So again, let's just go ahead and copy this, paste it over here, and let's change this to shift because we can have these same variable names. And let's also change this to pop. Update here and update here. So now instead of having the pop, we're going to change this to the shift method like so. And now our array is pretty much the same as it was in the beginning. Perfect. Another very useful array method is the index of method. And what this method does is it search for the whole array for a specific value, and it's going to return the position on which that value is saved inside the array. So for example, search value one, it's going to be equal to our array dot index of. And now let's say we want to search for the value three. Let's go ahead and console.log. And as you can see, we get back the number two representing the position of our search value. So it is indeed correct. If we go on to position two, then we get the value we are searching for. Now, if it doesn't find the value, like in this example, let's go ahead and try to search for 10. You can see that it's going to return minus one. So every time it doesn't find the value we are looking for inside the array, it's always going to return minus one. If it finds the element, then it's going to return the position where that element is inside the array. Now, bear in mind that if we have multiple equal values, like for example, if we add to our array another three, then it's going to return the same as before because it always returns the first found element. And because this three is the first three that it found, then it's going to return this position. Lastly, we have the includes method. And this is a very useful method because you will do a lot of this in the future to always check if a value is inside a array. And of course, this is going to return a Boolean. So either true, the element exists inside the array or false if it doesn't exist. And what we can do, for example, is say, if the example array includes the value two, then let's go ahead and console.log this array contains two. And there you go. As you can see, it returned true because there is in fact the value two. And so this piece of code is executed. Perfect. Okay, so now let's talk about another data structure type called object. Then to better understand objects, let's go ahead and check out this example. So we have three variables, each for a name, a balance, and a Boolean flag to check whether a user is an adult or not, which balance it currently has, and the current name of the user. So of course, we could represent the user using three different variables but it makes sense that we somehow had this all in the same variable, right? And one way we could do this is by using a object. So let's create a new variable and call it user. And this user variable is going to contain a object. And to initialize a object, you only have to give it a curly brackets. Now, mind you that this is not a function or a if statement, so we are not going to have statements inside the curly brackets because this is a object. So we are defining this variable as a object. And objects are defined using key value pairs. So if we take into account the following example, we know that our user is going to have a name. So the first key, it's going to be name. And then to define the value, we separate the key with the column. And then we simply type in the value for that key. So John Doe. We then have a second key. So we are going to separate it with comma. And it's going to be the balance. So separate the key from the value with the column. And then the value of 1000. Finally, we have the is adult flag that it's going to be true. Okay, and there we go. So now we have our object, which is going to be stored inside the user variable. 
And then we have three different keys. The first one being the name, the second one, the balance, and the third one, the is adult. For each of the keys, we then define the values. And we now have our object for the user. Now to access a value inside our object, for example, let's say the name of our user, we use the dot notation. So for example, we type in user, which will be our object. And now we want the name. So dot and then name. So if we go ahead and console.log, we can see that we get John Doe. If we want the balance, then simply change the name to balance. And now we have the balance of the user. Now, if you try to access something that doesn't exist, for example, the age of the user, you can see that you will get a undefined. And this makes sense because we did not define any age key inside our object. Let's revert this back to balance. So, and let's use another notation to fetch a key value pair. And that's by using the brackets notation. So let's go ahead and first of all, console.log and then user. And now instead of using the dot notation, we are going to create a brackets, much like the array. And now as a string, we are going to define the key we want to search the value for. So in this case, it's going to be the balance. So simply type in the balance like so. So as you can see, we get from the dot notation and from the brackets notation. Now, why do we have both and when should we use one and another? Well, typically when we have something predefined, like in this case, for example, we tend to use the dot notation because we already know what is inside the object and what we want to retrieve. But sometimes we want to fetch this kind of information dynamically. And if we want to do so, then with the dot notation is not possible. So for example, let's say that we have the balance after. And let's go ahead and copy and paste this. And we have the balance before. So of course, we could go ahead and using the dot notation, simply get either the balance before or after. So as you can see. Sorry, let's change this to 500 just so we can see the difference. Okay, perfect. But if you want to do this depending on a external factor, so for example, let's say that we have a new variable here called variable A and it says, for example, before. So one way we can fetch the information dynamically using this variable A is by inputting balance in brackets notation and then simply concatenating with the plus or the add operator with the variable a like so. So as you can see, we now can fetch the before balance because balance plus the variable a, which is before it's going to give us the string with the same key name for the object. If we want now to fetch the after, we simply need to change the variable a to after, and now we will get the balance after value. And of course, we can also change the values of a object. So it's the same logic from the arrays. While the object itself is a constant, you cannot change the object itself, but you can change all of the key values inside the object. So let's go ahead and change the balance before to something like one. For example, let's go ahead and copy this and simply paste it below. So as you can see, we had 500 and now we only have one. And of course, this can also be done using the brackets notation. So let's go ahead and do that. And this will do the same thing. Perfect. Another thing we can do is, for example, we know that our user has a name, a balance before, a balance after, and a is adult. But let's say that now we want the user to have an age. So to do so, simply refer to the new key you want to insert. So in this case, it's going to be H. And once more, you can use either the dot notation or the brackets notation, and then simply give it a value for the H. So if we now console.log our user, as we can see, we get the correct format in the console. And then if we open it, we see that not only we have the key values we've defined at the beginning, but we also have the one we added on line 22. Finally, I think this goes without saying, but you can also add objects inside object. 
So for example, let's go ahead and say best friend, for example. And this is also going to be another object with a name and whatever key value you prefer inside that object. Not only that, but you can also have arrays inside objects. So for example, we say that this user has some friends and each friend it's going to be a object, for example, with the name for each of our users' friends. So for example, let's go ahead and copy this and add a second friend called friend2. So as you can see, now our object also has a object inside, which is the best friend with the correct key and value pairs. And then it has a array with each element being also object inside. Okay, so we've seen that objects can have key and value pairs. It can be any of the other primitives. It can be objects itself, and it can also be arrays. What I didn't tell you and what we are going to see right now is that they can also have methods or functions. And the way you define a function inside a object is the same way as you define, first of all, a key value pair, only that this time the value is going to be a function. So let's go ahead and say that our user one object is going to have a key with the name say hello. And now the value for this key is going to be a function. So don't forget the parentheses, open the curly brackets, and then inside simply say console.log hello, like so, right? So this is still a value, only now instead of being either a string or a number or an array or an object is a function. So if we now want to call in this function, we can simply reference the user one object and using the dot notation, we simply say hello. But because this now is a function and you can actually see that with the yellow color over here, then this is callable. So don't forget the parentheses to actually call the function. And as you can see, we now get the hello on the terminal. If you want to call the function using the bracket notation, you can also do that by again, putting in the brackets and inside the name of our key, which in this case, it's say hello. But don't forget that this is a function, so we have to call it by putting in the parentheses, like so. Perfect. Now let's say we have another function to, for example, get the balance of the user. And of course, we can simply reference the balance key, but just for the sake of this example, let's say that we have a function that returns the balance of the user. So function, open parentheses, open curly brackets, and then inside we are going to return the user one dot balance, right? So if we now go ahead and console.log the user one dot get balance function, then you would get the balance of the user. Now, the problem with this approach is that, let's say for example, that user two also has this get balance function, right? So let's go ahead and copy this, paste it over here, and let's copy the console log, paste it on the bottom, and change this to user two. Oops. As you can see, we still are getting the balance from the user one. And that makes sense because we are referring to the user one over here. And of course we could change this to user two, but that doesn't make sense once we start having multiple and multiple objects and we have to keep track of all of them. So one thing you can use is the this keyword. So this like so. And what this does is reference the object itself. Let's go ahead and copy this also to the user too. And if we now call in the functions of each, if we are calling this function over here, then the this keyword over here is going to be user one because this is inside the user one and therefore it's going to reference itself. While if we call in the get balance from this one, then the this keyword, it's going to reference user two again, because this is inside the object and it's going to reference itself. So let's go ahead and refresh the page. 
and now we get the correct balance. Not only you can use the this keyword to get a value from the object, but you can also use it to change a value inside the object. So let's say that we have another function called apply cost. So it's going to be a function and it's going to receive a cost value. Now open the curly brackets. And for now, let's just return the balance of the user, like so. Now we want to change the balance of our user one by subtracting the cost we get from the function. So let's go ahead and reference the balance of this object. So this dot balance, right? It's going to be equal to the current balance of our object minus the cost or by using what we already know with the assign operator, then simply type in minus equal. So remember, this is going to be exactly the same as we just did. So now we can go ahead and copy this and also add to user two. And if we go here onto the bottom, let's create a new variable called cost and make it a value of 50. And now console.log, the user one dot apply cost like so pass in the cost variable and then do the same for the user two like so sorry and i have a mistake over here i added minus over here but it's actually just the cost because we are going to decrement the balance with the cost so the same thing over here like so so if we refresh now now we get the correct value so the balance before for user one and the balance after, the balance before for user two, and the balance after. Okay, so we are now entering on to the last concept you need to know in order to understand the basics of any programming language. And that concept is looping. And looping is nothing more than repeating a certain part of a code over and over and over again, as many times as we need to. So let's say we have a variable call counter, like so. And we want to modify this counter to increment n times. So first of all, because we want to change this variable, let's actually change this to a let, like so. And not only we want to increment our counter, so counter plus plus, right? We also want to console.log the following string. So current counter is and then simply inject the value of our counter. So if we run this, we will get the current counter is one, right? But now I want to do this until, for example, 20. Okay, so let's go ahead and just copy this, paste it, paste it, paste, 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 paste it, and you can see that we are never going to finish this. So one better way to do this is with loops. So let's go ahead and simply delete this, like so. And let's also delete the increment of our count. So the way the loops work is, first of all, by using the for keyword. And followed by the for keyword is a parenthesis, right? So like we have with the if statement, the switch statement, and then the curly brackets to execute the code we want to execute inside our loop. And of course, what we want to execute is the following string. So let's go ahead and cut this and simply paste it inside our loop. Now, the way the loop works is it's going to have inside our parentheses the following three blocks. So each block is separated by a semicolon, like so. So let's go ahead and already put two of them. So we have the first block, the second block, and the third block. Now the first block, it's going to be the one responsible for declaring a new variable that is going to change from loop to loop. So let's go ahead and create that variable. And by convention, let's call it I for index. Now we want to initialize this variable to zero. So we are going to have a variable I that's going to be equal to zero. And we are setting it as a let because this is going to be changed. Now for the last block, what we want to say is, what do we want to do with this variable every time a loop is over? Well, we want to increment our i. So i plus plus, right? So it starts at zero, 
But then once a loop is over, it's going to increment the i. So on the next loop, the i is going to be equal to one. And then again, two, three, four, and so on and so on. And of course, this is going to run until infinity. It's never going to stop unless we declare on the second block the condition to stop the loop. And I said before that I want to run this code 20 times. So since we are incrementing the i one by one for each loop, then I want the loop to run while the i is less than 20. Right, so the second block is in expression. And while this expression is true, then the code is going to stay looping. Once the expression is false, so when i is either 20 or bigger, then we are going to stop the loop and exit and continue to the bottom. So let's go ahead and already add a console log saying the final counter is and then print the count right so let's go ahead and refresh this and we can see that it did execute it 20 times right but it only executed the following string so in the console we never see the same log more than once so if it is the same value then the console simply is going to append the number of times that that value is being printed but if it is a different value like for example the following string which is not the same as this string then it's going to print on the bottom what we are missing is to actually increment our counter right because if we didn't have this like so then what's going to happen? Well, first of all, the i, it's going to be equal to zero, right? We are going to print the console log with the counter still at zero, and then it's going to loop back again. Now the i is equal to one. Then we print the log and again and again and again, and we are never incrementing the counter. So let's go ahead and uncomment this. And now we have the 20 lines of our current counter. Another way we could do this is that we know that our i is starting at zero, the same way it is the counter, and it's going to the maximum number we want. So instead of incrementing the counter, we can actually go ahead and say that our counter, it's going to be equal to i. So in this way, we not only are going to see the value of the counter on each log, we are also going to see the value of i because it's going to be saved on the counter. But now you've noticed that the counter is zero was called two times. And why is that? Well, let's go ahead and do this step by step. So the counter as of now is equal to zero. Once we enter the loop, then the i is zero. So the counter being printed here is going to be zero. But now we say that the counter is going to be equal to i. But the problem is that on this first loop, the i is still zero. So only when this statement is over, then we go over the loop again, and only then the i is equal to one. But our counter is still zero. So when we get again onto the console.log, then we are going to print the counter that's going to be zero. So one way to fix this is very simple. Instead of assigning the i to the counter after the console.log, let's just do it before. And there you go. Now we have everything working perfectly. And of course, we can change the values here. For example, let's say that we only want until 10. Let's say also that we want to start the i from 4. For example, as you can see, it goes from 4 to 10. And we also don't need to do one by one. We can say that we want to increment for each loop our i with 2, for example. Or if you prefer using the equality operator plus equal two. So we are not going to increment one by one, but two by two. And there you go. As you can see, four, six, eight. Now, one of the most useful things that a loop can do is to transverse an array. So for example, we have this example array over here and it has a few numbers inside. Now, let's say we want to log all of the elements inside our array onto the console. Well, for that, let's go ahead and create a for loop, right? So parentheses, open curly brackets for now. And then the first thing we want to do is declare the variable that's going to change. 
for each loop. And again, I'm going to go with the convention of naming it I. The last block is going to be what we are going to change that variable to. So we are going to increment by one. And then we want to say that this is going to run until I is less than the size of the array. And of course we could do this manually, but we already know that we can get the length of the array by typing in the name of the array and then dot length, like so. So this is going to start on zero and it's going to go until it is less than the length of the array. Now let's go ahead and console.log the following template literal. So current position is, and then let's go ahead and inject I, right? Because we are going to go one by one for each of the positions of our array, starting from zero until the length of our array. And the value is, go ahead and inject again. And how are we going to get the value? So example array, open brackets, and then the position we want to get the value from. And because we are going one by one for each of the array positions, then we are going to put here the i, right? Let me just open this a little bit, like so. And we are going to get, so the current position at the beginning is going to be zero. And the value is example array position zero, which in turn will be one. Then the loop ends, it's going to go back to the beginning because zero is still less than the length of the array. And it will go on and on and on until the i is going to be either equal or greater than the length of the array. So let's go ahead and refresh and let's just pull this so we can see it better. Like so, perfect. So as you can see, we have the current position going from zero to 15, which is the size of our array. And then we get the correspondent values for each of the positions of the array. So one, five, three, zero, six, and everything seems okay. Perfect. Now let's go ahead and simply comment this. So we have some space here in the logs. You can always clear the logs by going and pressing this button over here. So clear console, like so, perfect. And let's learn the concept of breaking a loop. So remember that we had this array method to find the index of a value we are searching. So let's say that we want to find the value of eight inside the array. So we are going to type in the name of our array dot, and then the method is the index of, and then the value eight, right? Let's go ahead and first of all, console.log, the found value. Actually, this is going to be the index. So let's go ahead and change the name. And let's go ahead and refresh. And we get five, telling us that the first eight that we found is on position five. So let's go ahead and check this. So starting from zero, one, two, three, four, five, and it is correct. Now, what I want to do with you guys, so you can understand the breaking loop is to try and replicate this index of method. So remember that the index of returns minus one if we don't find a element. So let's start by that. Let's start assuming that our for loop is not going to find the element we are looking for. So therefore our found value index is going to be by default minus one. Now let's go ahead and try to implement the index of ourselves. So let's start by creating another for loop. And it's going to be exactly the same as the one above because we want to check every position of our array. So initialize the i to zero, and then i has to be less than the length of our array. And we are going to increment our i for each loop. So now we can get all of the values inside our array. And we need to find the index in which our value is equal to, well, in this case, eight. So let's go ahead and also create a new variable called value to search equals eight, right? So we want to find the position of our eight in the array. So the first thing we can do is actually get the value for each of the positions. So let's go ahead and create a new variable called current value. And it's going to be equal to our example array 
open brackets and then I. So we are going to select for each of the positions in our array and save it on the current value. Just to make sure, go ahead and console.log our current value. And before we do anything else, let's go ahead and refresh the page. Okay, and it seems good. So it starts with one, then five, three, zero, six, two times eight, so eight, eight, zero, two, and so on and so forth. Being the last one, the found value index, which currently is minus one. Now, how can we change now the found value index when it reaches the value we are searching? Well, easy. So let's go ahead and first of all, remove this. And let's say that if the current value is equal to the value to search, so if one of these values is going to be equal to the one we are searching for, right? Open curly brackets. Then we say that our found value index is going to be equal to i, right? So if the value is equal to the value we are searching, then the current position of that value, which is i, is going to be saved inside the found index. So let's go ahead and refresh this. And of course, I've made an error. Sorry about that, because this cannot be a constant because we want to change this value. So let's go ahead and change this to a let, like so, and refresh again. Okay, but we got six instead of five. We should have gotten five. So what's wrong here? Well, let's go ahead and console.log again our values. So current value, like so, and refresh. Let's go step by step. First value. Is it the one we're searching for? No. Okay, then next one. No, 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 no. And then this one it is. So it's the fifth position, which is going to be eight. But the problem here is that the sixth position is also eight. So we first store our found value index to five, but then we go again onto the next loop and on the position six, we are going to get the current value also equal to eight, which is the value we are searching. And now instead of being five inside our found value index, we are going to have six. And then it's going to go on and on and on and on until the end of the array. If we had, for example, a eight over here, like so, then it would go and first of all, save the five, then the six, and then the position, 13, because it would be the last eight that is going to go onto this expression. So if we refresh, as you can see, we get 13, but we only want the first eight. So what we can do is break the loop and break simply means to terminate the loop. So once we found our found value, we simply type in the keyword break. So now if this expression is true for the first time, then we are going to save the position on our found value index, which again, it's going to be five. And then we are going to break the loop. So once we break the loop, everything below, but inside our loop is not going to be executed anymore. And we are simply going to go off the loop onto the next line, which in this case is going to be 22. So let's go ahead and refresh this. And there you go. We have the first values being printed. And then just for argument's sake, let's change this so we can see that this is in fact the final one. So found value index is, and then inject our value like so. And there you go. So we have each of the values of the loop until it founds the first one, which is going to be the eight after this sticks over here. And then it breaks the loop. So this console.log for the value eight is not going to be executed. And we get off the loop and execute the last console.log, which is the correct found value index. Perfect. Now the continue keyword. So to continue the loop, what does that mean? And why would you use that? So let's take in the same example array, but let's say now that we want a new array with all of the values inside this one that are not zero. So all of the positive values. Well, first of all, let's go here at the bottom and let's say we want a new array variable and it's going to be a empty array. So simply brackets and just so we don't have to type it again, simply copy the for loop. It's going to be the same 
and just delete everything inside the for loop, like so. Okay, so again, we have a loop that's going to traverse the whole array. What we now want to do is say that for each of the current values, so current value, it's going to be the example array at a position i, like so, we want to push this new value onto the new array, like so. Then let's go ahead and console.log the new array. So as it is, it's going to, of course, print out the same exact array with the zeros. But now we are going to simply add a new condition saying if the current value is equal to zero, so the value we want to remove from the array, then we are going to continue like so. So what this does is every time we find the value that's equal to zero, we want to continue, meaning that we are not going to execute everything that's on the bottom, but instead we are going to go on to the next step of the loop. So we are going to continue the loop and ignore everything in front of the same loop. So in theory, we should only push the values every time they are not equal to zero, because if they are, they are just going to go on to the next iteration of the loop. And there you go. You now have a new array without any zeros. Let's now go ahead and try to reverse the following array. So we know how to go from the start to finish, but now let's go from the finish to start. So let's go ahead and create our for loop and create our i. But now instead of beginning in position zero, we want to begin on the last position. And we already know how to do that. So it's going to be the length of our array minus one, right? Because our array contains five elements. So the last position is going to be position four. Now let's go ahead and add the third block. And since we are going to start from, in this case, four, what do we want to do with our i? Well, we want to decrement, right? Because we want to start from position four to three, two, one, and zero. Now, until when do we want to do this? Well, we want to continue our loop while our i is greater or equal to zero, right? So once our i is below or lesser than zero, then we don't want to do anything else and we want to break the loop. So let's go ahead and add our curly brackets and let's console log the example array at position five. Now, one cool thing you can do with our console log is that you can actually log multiple values. So each value can be separated with a comma. So let's go at the beginning and also print our i. So we can get on the terminal the position we are currently in and the value inside that position on the array. So let's go ahead and refresh this. And that seems about right. So we begin on index four, which has the value E and then D C B A. And this will still work independently on the number of elements inside the array because we are going to fetch from the left of the array. So if we now have, for example, F, then we can see that it still works and we can now loop backwards from our array. Now, I've told you before that we can have arrays inside arrays and we can also create loops inside loops. So for example, if we have the example square array, and this is going to be, first of all, an array like so, and it's going to have three elements and each of these elements is also going to be an array. So it's an array containing three arrays inside. And then each of these arrays is going to have also three elements, which are going to be either true or false. So let's go with false. And here we can say it's false, true, and false. And here we can say it's false, false, and true. Right, so now let's go ahead and create a new for loop and let's iterate through these arrays inside arrays. So first of all, we have our typical for loop to traverse the first array. So it's going to be with the i equals zero and the i is going to be until the end of our example square array dot length. 
And don't forget that this is a array that contains three arrays. So the length is going to be three in this case. We now can get the current value, which again, don't forget, it's going to be also a array. And for starters, let's go ahead and already print our current value. So refresh. And as you can see, we are going to print the three arrays inside our main array. Now, what we want to do is inside create another for loop and let's call this J, right? And bear in mind that you can put the same name for the variable as we have above. We have to put in a different name. And now our J is going to be until the current value, which we know again, it's an array. So if it is an array, then we can actually get the length of this value and then simply increment our J. Open brackets. And now let's just copy this console.log, paste it over here. And instead of this being the current value, let's go ahead and first of all, get the current, current value. So the value inside the second loop. So we know that it's going to be with the I. So this is going to get one of the three arrays. And then what we can do is to specify the index position of that sub array, we can go ahead and create a new bracket. So for example, let's say that this was one, then we were going to get this second array. And then if we add here, for example, two, then we would get zero, one, two, the last item, which would be false in this case. Right, so this is how you fetch the values inside the arrays inside arrays by the index positions. So if we go ahead and print the positions on our Y and then the positions on our J, because again, the J is the one that's going to traverse this sub arrays and the I it's the one that's going to traverse the upper array. Then if we now go ahead and refresh, we can see that we simply get the values inside each of the positions of the arrays. If you want to print also the positions, we can go ahead and console.log the I and the J. So refresh it. And as you can see, we have the positions for each of the values. So zero, zero, which will be this first element going to be true. Then zero, one, false, zero, two, false, one, zero, false, one, one, true, and so on and so forth. Now, the cool thing about doing this with the length of each array is that let's say that the middle array has one more element, like so. Well, that's not a problem because once we get onto this array, then our current value is going to be, well, that array, and we will get the correct length, which will be four. So the J in this specific case, it's going to go from zero to four and print out the values. So let's go ahead and check that. And there you go. You can see that if we are on the middle array represented here by the first position being one, we get four values instead of three. Perfect. Okay, so, and finally, we are going to see the while loop. And like the for loop, this one, it's going to iterate over and over our code while a expression is true. So you start off by writing while, like so, open parentheses and open brackets. So much like the other statements, we are going to have the expression inside our parentheses and then the code we want to execute inside the curly brackets. So let's go ahead and first of all, console.log something inside like so. And be careful when using the while loop because you can accidentally make it infinite. So it never stops. And one way to actually replicate this is to evaluate the expression inside the parentheses to true. And just for argument's sake, let's go ahead and see what this does. So as you can see, it's just looping and looping and looping the same string without ever stopping. So be careful while using loops because there is a high chance of you making a non-stopping loop. Let's just revert this back to false so we can stop this. And you might need to close your window because this is now stuck on a infinite loop. And now let's see some examples on how to use the while loop. So the most basic one can be the counter loop. So let's say we want to execute this loop 
10 times. And each time we do a loop, we are going to decrement our counter like so. So the way to make this run 10 times is say while our counter variable is greater than zero, then we want to loop and decrement the counter. So let's go ahead and check this. And as you can see, the loop ran 10 times. And just for argument's sake, let's go ahead and print out the counter. And there you go. You get all of the values of our counter. So in this example, we have an array with strings inside. And what we want to do is to actually loop for each element inside the array while there are elements inside the array. So let's go ahead and build our while loop. And let's say that we want to keep running this loop while our example dot array dot lamp like so is greater than zero. So while there are still items inside, then we want to continue this loop. So curly brackets. And now let's go ahead and remove the first element of the array. And remember, in order to do that, it's going to be the name of our array and then using the method ship like so. So again, this is a array method that's going to remove the first element from the array and then return it and save it in this case on the variable element. Now let's go ahead and simply log our element like so. And because we know that every time we are going to iterate through the loop, it's going to have minus one element. Then at the end, it's going to have a length of zero, making this expression false and then exiting the loop. So let's go ahead and see that. And there you go. So we have each of the elements of the array. And as soon as we get the last element, then the length of our array is going to be zero. This expression is going to be false and the while loop will stop. Congratulations on completing this course. I hope that you've enjoyed what I had to teach you and that you found this course useful. Not only that, but I really do hope that you now feel comfortable in using JavaScript and begin tackling greater challenges. But before we end this, I'd like to share a few things. Firstly, this course is just the beginning. There's still a lot to learn in JavaScript and we've only scratched the surface. Things like scoping, DOM interaction, recursive functions, classes, to name a few. Secondly, simply watching the videos is not enough. Go practice. Try in building your own examples by mixing up everything you've learned in this course and just see what comes out of it. Also, try to replicate some kind of app you already know and start simple, like for example, try to build your own calculator. I cannot say this enough. Only by practicing do you become a better programmer, so go for it. And if you're interested in going down the front-end developer path, you can also go ahead and start learning HTML and CSS by watching my introduction course. If you want to master web development, I highly recommend you to learn these three languages and how they work with each other. But I hope that you like this course and you feel excited to start and learn more. It's been a pleasure having you here and I am very grateful for the opportunity to accompany you. Until the next one, cheers.